The question why Bitcoin can and will become the global reserve asset and not only, you know, as a store of value, medium exchange unit account and global settlement layer uh, can only be ex explained, you know, when you zoom out and you can connect the dots. That's why we have experts like Greg Foss. I'm really looking forward to my next talk. He's, um, he's got like over 30 years in experience in the, you know, uh, banks, bonds, credit markets in totality and his insights around uh, within Bitcoin and, uh, you know, the whole conditions of the banking industry and global economy are just fantastic. It's just amazing. So if you haven't, uh, you know, read his report, why every fixed income investor needs to consider Bitcoin as portfolio insurance, what credit markets are telling investors, how to understand them, how to, how to protect yourself from what's coming, you should definitely download it. I'm going to put those in the, sh in the show notes for free. Make sure you follow him on Twitter. Uh, he's got an amazing, you know, uh, broad spectrum of knowledge, comprehension, and uh, and ability, the skill to break things down, and to zoom out and explain this. This uh, so so you know a seven year old child or a, you know mature brain can can understand this without having the background knowledge of all the you know interconnected uh, uh, issues here. So without further ado, this is my talk with Greg Foss. Make sure you follow him if you have any questions or comments. Uh, let me know and enjoy this. Welcome to the show, Greg Foss. How are you doing, man? Oh, I'm doing very well, thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here. Greg, I mean, I've been following you. It's um, And to be honest, I've got to admit, uh, I had to reread your report like three times because you know, there's so much macro technical terminology, if I may use that. And, you know, I've, I listened to you, some of your interviews lately, you know, from Bitcoin, it was, was amazing. And also with, uh, was it with John Vallis or, and or with um, Daniel Prince, it was awesome. Um, let me just start off. I mean, there are some specific questions I have in regards, you know, to the global debt, you know, derivatives. And I think finally of, of, of meeting someone like you who, who could explain this like in a broader context, you know, to help me and my listeners sure. connect the dots. Sure. And if you're using some terminology, you know, like spread yield curve control or contango, maybe you can explain this and not, you know, because there's a lot of people I think who don't understand really the terminology. What's what's the background of it, you know, to connect the dots. Okay. Um, okay, so you wrote about you know Bitcoin is considered as a def uh, as a default insurance uh, on a basket of govern uh, of of uh, uh, sovereign fiats, and uh, you also quoted you know this is what's what really fascinates me is the Institute of International Finance, and I knew that already. The global debt is around like two hundred fifty trillion dollars, and I think Correct. by now it should be like yes. two hundred seventy or something. Yeah. yeah. But with all the unfunded liabilities, I mean, how is it even possible we come to a quadrillion dollars? It's your floor, so, please. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, wow, what a way to say, what a great question to start with. And, uh, you know, you say, how is it even possible? And, well, we are where we are. So what we have to do is understand that, uh, in my opinion, and it's based on mathematics that I do. And here's, I, I saw an interesting quote the other day. Uh, it said that math is the base layer of language. And I found that quite uh, remarkable in that, uh, think about that, the, you know, there's so many different languages in the world, but everyone understands mathematics and everyone uh, can communicate on that basis. And so then that quote uh, drew the parallel as Bitcoin being the base layer of money. Okay, so we, I don't want to dive down that rabbit hole too much, but the base layer of mathematics, uh, if you take the total global debt, which uh, is a fact, and you divide it by the total economy, the global economy, essentially the tax base, if you will, it's my belief that uh, it's impossible to uh, exit from what I call a debt, D-E-B-T spiral. It's very simple. Uh, the debt without any addition to the debt because of deficits is growing due to the economy, excuse me, due to the coupon on the debt at a faster rate than the global economy is growing. And that's because it's uh, approximately four times as large as the global economy okay so if it's four times as large in the numerator and if we put a coupon on that and i'm guessing here and i think i'm low if the average coupon is three percent then you, you can imagine that 
the economy has to grow at 12% in the denominator just to keep pace with the numerator. That's fairly simple mathematics, right? But people don't generally even take it to that level. And I know most politicians don't take it to that level. Um, you wrote, uh, or you tweeted sometime that you would you would love to see a challenge or a discussion, you know, a debate between you and Peter Schiff. Has he, uh -huh. has he already accepted your challenge? Yeah, or or why do you think is that? Well, here's the neat thing. Um, so I, I would like to, absolutely. And then there's so many smart people on uh, Bitcoin Twitter that uh, I think a lot of people have convinced me not to... Uh, Not to go there. Uh, I would certainly accept the challenge. I have a bit of a, a history with uh, with Peter and his and his family. I'm I'm proud to say that uh, when I and so I got involved in in Twitter uh, maybe I'm going to say eight months ago now. And uh, I'm an old guy, and so I was not aware of the power of social platforms. But when I was uh, first uh, uh, a newbie to Bitcoin Twitter, uh, and I still am a newbie, but uh, Uh, at least I understand how it works. Um, I, uh, I engaged Peter Schiff's son, Spencer Schiff, and it happened to be his birthday. And I said, come on, Spencer, admit you have a Bitcoin wallet. And, you know, I didn't expect to get anything back. And um, sure enough, Spencer says, I have a Bitcoin wallet and I own $400 worth of Bitcoin. So I, I sort of look around. I'm, I remember that time I, I could, didn't look around. I was by myself. I, I was, am I being trolled here? Is this true? You know. And anyway, I'm uh, I'm pretty excited, and I, I retweeted. I go, uh, Spencer owns 400 bucks. He sees the light. Happy birthday! I'm going to send you some money. Send me your address. Or I'll send you some Bitcoin rather. So he sends me his. Uh, his uh, Bitcoin address and, and uh, I, I sent him uh, probably $20 US worth of, uh, worth of Bitcoin. And I said, happy birthday, kid. Do not spend this. Do not spend this. I want you to own it for the rest of your life. And that was it. So then the next morning, Peter Schiff gets on, the, on his platform and goes, my son uh, is only 18 years old or something. It was 18 or 19. He's allowed to make mistakes. Uh, and I responded, well, perhaps he understands how to do math, Peter. He, he can see that uh, on an expected value basis, if, and I laid out a binary distribution for him, quite simple. I said, and one of the, one of the, uh, the binary outcomes was uh, if Bitcoin goes to a million dollars. And the other was if it goes to zero. And he, he comes back and shows Schiff engaged me. The only time he's ever engaged me, he goes, Uh, there's not a chance in the world that Bitcoin goes to a million dollars of Bitcoin. My son is 18. What's your, what, and he's foolish. What's your excuse? And I'm like, okay, game on. I want to challenge you now, Peter, you know, you're calling me out. So since that day, I've, I've tried unsuccessfully to, uh, to engage with him uh, on a public platform. And then most people are telling me, well, in, in the past, he's, uh, he, you know, he just shuts the, the opponent down, uh, talks over them and everything like that. So, you know, on the right, uh, under the right rules and everything, perhaps I would, uh, but he doesn't want to engage a guy like me. I'm, I'm a small fry. He's, you know, he does a lot of this for theater, in my opinion. And I certainly, the first thing he would do is look at uh, something like, hey, it doesn't matter what my experience is. How many followers does this knucklehead have? Uh, oh, okay. He's not worth my time, but pomp. I'll, I'll go after pomp because, uh, you know, pomp is a, is a big man. Uh, in the Twitterverse. And so, you know, I'd love to do it, Kevin, but you know, the truth is, uh, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, it would be really hard to get it on the right, uh, on the right terms. Yeah. You know, Greg, what I'm asking is because, you know, I always respected and appreciated um, Peter Schiff's knowledge and he has a comprehensive, like really broad spectrum of knowledge, macro, I mean, amazing, amazingly intelligent. This is what, uh, you know, and my theory is that would he like lose his face or his business, his clients, because he has to stick to a certain dogma? It, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, right? How can a guy get 97% there to the right answer? Uh, and then not take it to the next step. He, he is definitely conflicted. Okay. I know he knows the value of Bitcoin. I believe he feels that it uh, challenges his gold business and there's no question, but it, it, having, 
you know, as a trader for 30 years, I, uh, I survived by, by adjusting to the information that was presented to me. If I was in the wrong, I quickly reversed the position. I, I didn't try and hedge it with, uh, you know, by saying, okay, well, I'm long this thing and I believe it's going down. So I'm going to try and short something that's in a similar, uh, you know, uh, industry or whatever and, and try and hedge myself. The best, the best, there's an expression, it's called the best hedge is a sale. Okay. Meaning don't try and complicate or uh, compound your, your errors. Well, Peter, uh, in this case, his best hedge would have been to embrace Bitcoin as a gold alternative or even better digital gold. Now it doesn't mean he has to go all in. Nobody goes all or very few people go all in on a single trade, especially if you're a risk manager. Imagine you took your portfolio to uh, your boss and said, I, uh, I've decided that I'm going to be a 100% in one security for the rest of the time. I mean, your boss might look at you and go, but dude, you know, that is not great risk management. You may be committed to it and conviction is a beautiful thing, but to categorically dismiss it on a regular basis and then actually use uh, what could be termed uh false uh narratives uh that i have a problem with that yeah um greg can you explain uh what is what do you, what do you mean by credit risk default risk sure thanks great question so so any and and actually for the longest time uh any any uh practitioners in the financial markets would typically uh they would refer to the U.S. Treasury as the quintessential risk-free rate. So I'm going to assume your, your, most of your listeners know what a yield curve is. And essentially, to, just to very quickly summarize, the yield curve is just a, uh, a graphical representation of the different borrowing rates that the U.S. Treasury will pay as a function of the term of the, uh, uh, of the obligation. And um, it's generally upward sloping, which means lower terms, require a lower rate uh, as compensation, primarily for interest rate or, in, uh, or um, interest rate or inflation risk. Now, let's just assume, assume for the moment that that in fact is a risk-free rate. If you were to plot a govern, excuse me, a, the yield curve or even take the obligation, if a, if a corporation or a, another entity that borrowed money had one um, uh, obligation outstanding and you, and that obligation was yielding uh, for a number, let's say 4%, you take that 4%, you match it up with the yield curve of the government and you take a spread. That spread is called a credit spread. It will be higher than the U.S. government because people need to be compensated for the potential of that obligation, uh, not uh, that that credit not meeting its obligations, and that is compensation for credit risk. Sometimes the word credit risk and default risk are used interchangeably. I, I don't want to get too technical, but think of it as being compensation for uh, uh, the, the event of default. Now, in a risk reward world, that's where you make your decision. Would you rather own a quintessential risk-free in that term, or do you move out the risk spectrum and own a high-grade corporate bond uh, my specialty was junk bonds. So, you know, I was sort of quite far out there on the risk spectrum. Uh, but there I was, uh, you know, there were times that I believed I was being overcompensated for uh, the actual risk. And therefore, I'd be a buyer uh, if I didn't believe that the risk was appropriate, but I wasn't going to make a bet on it. I was neutral. But what if, you know, you felt that a credit was trading too tight to its uh, uh, respective uh, government yield, you, t you would take a short position. And that's how you manage credit risk. Um, it's a function of, uh, uh, you know, the credit quality of a borrower is a function of a lot of metrics. The, the best metric to think about is its cash flow. How many times its cash flow can meet its uh, in interest obligation 
and uh, then you know take that to the next level and start looking at at sovereign credits. And then you realize, hey, some of these sovereign credits certainly aren't risk free. And in fact, the U.S. Treasury is not default risk free. Hence, there is. I want to don't want to jump too far ahead, but hence there is a uh, default. Uh, credit default swap market for sovereign credits, including the United States, which is greater than zero. If it was zero, then in fact, it would be a risk-free borrower, but it's not zero. People are purchasing protection on the U.S. Treasury uh, because they believe there is a chance the U.S. Treasury does not meet its obligations. Okay. And is that on a global scale? These are, uh, it's, it's traded globally by very sophisticated uh, counterparties, correctly. Okay. Um, let me ask you about this negative yielding bonds, because you said, you know, some report, these are no longer an investment. How is it even possible to have negative yielding bonds in the whole ratio behind yeah, it's, it? It's sort of, it, well, it, it certainly blew my, my world apart, right? Um, generally, when you lend money to somebody, you, uh, you expect to get more money back, right? I mean, that's the risk that, uh, that you, uh, you know, that's how you get compensated for, uh, for risk. Imagine in a negative yielding bond, you lend someone $100 and including interest and in everything, they pay you back 97 man, that doesn't sound like a real great investment to me. You know, you're, you've just lost 3%. And uh, well, that's what a neg negative yielding bond is. Now, does it mean that you can't make money by purchasing a negative yielding bond? And you can, but it is, firstly, it's picking up nickels in front of a steamroller, in my opinion. And it absolutely, you can know that you will lose $3, but you can purchase it that bond anticipating you'll lose $3. But if the yield goes further negative, you can actually make money because there's a bigger fool in the room. And that bigger fool will pay you more money uh, than the $3, meaning you can actually make your money back. It's, it, bond, bond math is difficult to begin with. And when you start talking about negative yielding bonds, it really, really starts uh, getting confusing. So I don't, I don't want to, uh, to go too far down that, uh, that, that path. But uh, yeah, negative yielding bonds, why? Very simply because the uh, European Central Bank, that's where most of the negative yielding debt is, is in Europe. Uh, the European Central Bank is, is forcing rates at that, uh, at that level. Okay, those people that are profiting off of this, I mean, you know, we've heard like socializing losses. Is yes. that like within, because I'm trying to zoom out and see that like structurally, are these like structures, entities that are, that have nothing to fear, you know, to lose money, you know, when we've seen like 2008, 2000, like, like, you know, socializing losses, they don't need to, they are no, there's no liability. Um, that's sort of a neat way to think about it. Well, first of all, let's talk about what socializing losses is. That typically means uh, when a big bank uh, uh, or a big institution that's taken taken risks that deserve to be punished, meaning they've they've gone out and they've you know they they own too much subprime lending uh, or subprime debt. In the case of Bear Stearns and uh, and Lehman Brothers, um, you know they did not save Lehman Brothers, but they basically saved every single other. And I'm talking when I say they, I mean the Fed saved every other financial institution that had similar risks on their books, uh, and 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 what's called socialized the losses. They took you know the the troubled asset relief program TARP T A R P. What was that? Well, that was taking the troubled assets off the uh, the books and putting them on the balance sheets of the of, of the fed uh, thereby socializing or protecting the uh, the losses of uh, of these institutions um, you know there's conspiracy theories uh, you know the head of the fed ex goldman sachs goldman sachs would have failed if they let aig fail so they socialized losses at aig to protect goldman sachs 2008 2009 was a very very scary uh, time in my trading career because it really, really was close to unraveling. Um, but then coming back to what you're saying about socializing losses with, with the bond market, negative yielding, harder for me to make that, uh, that actual comment, except to say that they do it because they actually think that while it's horrible for the lender, it's great for the borrower, right? It, it tries to enhance economic activity because it'll tell people to borrow debt. And, and imagine that, borrow debt and get money. Borrow debt and make money by borrowing. 
because that's what you do. That's so, amazing. you know, it's so perverted. Um, well, but, you know, we, Calling like you talk about actually we're talking about, I think conflict of interest. I mean, there's a huge conflict of interest being going and still going on, right? Uh, somehow, I mean, you can't maybe prove it in all like instances. Um, uh, Kevin, you know what it is? It's um, it's how it's always been. You know, you you can either call it a conflict or you can actually say, well, look, <laughs> it's always been this way. Um, banks have always been way way levered to the uh, to the understanding. So if, if you assume a typical commercial bank is about twenty five times levered to its uh, its risk absorbing capital, uh, think about that for one second, and then think about how that system can be. Uh, well, first of all, how it can become insolvent on a, on a fairly regular basis, which has happened three times in my career. In my 30 year career, the financial system has been insolvent three separate times. Um, well, if you accept that, that it happens, uh, you know, on a fairly regular basis, then it is what it is. Well, so Greg, you said in your report also, and uh, elsewhere, every insurance company, pension fund, and most large and small institutions own government bonds. Now, if they understood, you know, what your comprehensive knowledge and the facts and the essence of Bitcoin, why, why aren't there more pension funds going all into like, you know, the curious is gone. There is a fiduciary duty. There is uh -huh. you no know, irrational thinking should be behind it. Why, why, why isn't that taking place? This is what surprises me at a faster pace. Oh, I love, I love the question. And, and, and the reality is first of all, look, um, so these guys, uh, these guys are smart. It's not like there are not smart players, uh, you know, at, at, at the heads of, uh, of all of these institutions, okay? They're very smart. They're wise. Uh, they also know, uh, well, let's take an example where, you know, I'm 57 years old. Um, and I didn't, uh, I did not find, if you will, I did not. It, uh, fall down the rabbit hole and actually see the beauty of Bitcoin until four years ago. But that's not crazy because Bitcoin is only 12 years old, right? Uh, more than two thirds of my entire trading career has been without this tool called Bitcoin. Uh, even if I found it at day one, I still would have been 20 odd years into my, into my trading career. Y you know, it takes a lot of time to, to look outside the box and then you can dismiss it because a lot of people will dismiss it because they do not want it to succeed. Right. So there's that, uh, status quo bias where, Oh boy, boy I really hope it doesn't succeed. I don't want to help it succeed because if it does, I can see how it will disintermediate my business. Um, and then there's people that actually do the work and, uh, they, they, say, wow, this thing is fantastic, except, you know, like five years ago, the market cap was, uh, I'm going to guess, uh, when I, five years ago, let's say it was a hundred, uh, a uh, thousand bucks just to make it easy. Um, and a thousand bucks times 21 million, even though 21 million weren't issued, you know, you're talking about a $200 million, a $200 billion, uh, market, which for many institutions, that's just way too small, right? Like it just, they, even if they loved it, they don't buy micro cap stocks or small cap stocks. Why? Cause they're just too large. They need to be able to play in bigger markets. So, so a lot of this is just, look, it's, it's a uh, push pull. Um, it's, Hey, first of all, I don't want it to succeed. Uh oh, now it's succeeding. Okay. So I want to, I better, I better do some work on it. Then, you know, to get it through your investment committee and everything like that, as, as Michael Saylor, you know, he, he, he's the CEO of his own company and he had to, you know, buckle down and, and tell all his directors, you got to study this, you got to study it. Well, when you're at a huge institution, you know, first of all, you don't have that much time to, to, and, and you're not the boss. You're not the guy that says, Hey, you know, sailor, beautiful thing, do this. Whereas other people are like, man, I wish you would do this. And other people are like, oh, I don't have the time or I don't have, or come on, let's pretend it doesn't exist. Cause I'm scared uh, of what it'll do. So, you know, again, 12 years is such a small, uh, uh, period in, in, in the life of a financial, uh, instrument. It's not surprising in my mind, but that then Kevin, that's what makes it, uh, you know, exciting for me is because 
so many people have not done the work. So many people still have these intellectual lazy moments where they say, oh, I read it in the newspaper that it's used by uh, nefarious uh, uh, individuals. I mean, that is so lame, but that's the status quo bias that uh, is human nature. Yeah, but, you know, with the two of us, I mean, we have something come. I went into a rabbit hole, I think, like you, like four years ago. And, you know, I think, uh, to be honest with you, I think people like you who are engineers or Lynn Alden or uh, Michael Saylor, you know, who is what, an aeronautical engineer or something like yeah, that? Yeah, rocket scientist, yeah. Yeah, and I think you guys are better economists, be honest with you. <laughs> I think you have sort of this, I don't know, this gifted analytical uh, deduction, you know, uh, capabilities or... Uh, knowledge or mean, background I'm, knowledge huh <laughs> uh, thanks you know but and, and it's true what, what do engineers have okay first of all uh as an engineer uh and i i will be very honest with you i've never been a practicing mechanical engineer that's what i graduated and i did take a turbo machinery course which is a, a form of rocket you know of the rocket science spectrum i i sort of get what michael saylor uh has experienced in terms of his uh uh education and his uh you know he's a walking mainframe and most computer engineers that are brilliant i'm not a brilliant engineer the brilliant engineers they are so smart but they can't communicate <laughs> they're just so smart they understand math and but they're a walking mainframe computer. The beautiful thing about uh, Sailor is he's got the gift of gab and he's brilliant. He understands it. So what, what do engineers really understand more than anything? They understand math, the base layer of language. They're not really good at talking in other languages, but man, when they talk math, that's it. And, and that's what Bitcoin is. It's math and code, right? So to me, it's it's a natural that uh, that engineers get it. Um, you know, they take the his uh, interpretation of the first law of thermodynamics, the uh, conservation of energy. That that was a brilliant eye opening, and for me, yeah, I got it right away. Digital energy. You take natural energy from the ground, convert it into digital energy. That's the most valuable store of value in the history of mankind. Do you think a lot of people have a hard time, like? in the terms of in the par this paradigm shift of thinking, like because it's not physical, it's like, you know, it's like sort of a, like an ether, like non-physical, okay. like to, to think in that, in those terms, digital, you know, the, young kids, the, the old guys, the old guys like me do. Okay. The young kids that have grown up with an iPhone in their hand for their whole life. Uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, this is natural. It's the money of the internet. Like as natural as the internet is to these kids, the internet was something that, first of all, I graduated, started to work in 1988. I had barely used a personal computer because they did not exist until two years prior. I graduated from my undergraduate degree in engineering, having never used a personal computer because they did not exist, okay? It, you know, we were using punch cards on mainframe computers. We were, we were coding in, uh, you know, uh, music, uh, what is it? Music C+, plus, uh, you know, uh, uh, God, I don't even remember the other, uh, you know, the bit, uh, you know, D base and uh, all these other uh, languages. And now it's on the computers if it's, uh, or sorry, on your iPhone. There's more power on your iPhone than was required to put two men on the moon. And and these, this is what the kids are uh, uh, growing up with these days. So it's natural for old guys like me. Um, no, it's not that natural. So yeah, how do you visualize it? Well, I think that Sailor does an amazing job calling it digital energy, because that's what it is. And, you know, what is money? If you take it back to the base principles of money, I'm going to quote Ross Stevens, who is the uh, chairman of uh, uh, Stone Ridge Capital and, uh, you know, uh, part owner of NYDIG, uh, New York Digital Investment Group. In his shareholder letter, uh, he wrote that money has always been a technology for storing the value of your work, which as we know in engineering, work is energy. Then he said the value of your work, energy, or time expended today for consumption in the future. And if you think of it that way, what is energy? 
well, energy is sort of in itself a, you know, you know that it takes energy, physical energy to, to sometimes if you're earning money uh, or you're paid, it takes physical energy or it takes your time or it takes your brain energy. Those, those things are similar, aren't, are they not? They, uh, they sort of exist, but you can't really tell what it is. You can't put your finger on it. Well, if that's, if you accept that principle, that conservation of energy is, uh, you know, essentially Bitcoin, uh, first law of thermodynamics. Well, then, as an engineer, I, I, I can grasp that concept pretty quickly. You know, I'm also a fan of um, Jeff Booth's book, The Price of Tomorrow, Why Deflation oh, is the Key to a Climate Future. Book. Yeah, be the best book I've ever read. I'm not kidding. Yeah. You. And, and, and I'm proud to call him a fellow Canadian. I, I reached out to him. Sorry to jump on top of you here, but I reached out to him the last time I was in Vancouver and uh, we had a great conversation. Uh, honestly, if it's not the best book I've ever read, it's absolutely within the top five. Yeah, and which a book, you know, which also the average person can understand, like, you know, the, the fundamentals of what he's trying to, I'm trying, I was going to ask you, like, have you ever thought or imagined, like, what a world would look like with, with this, you know, with this absolute beautiful uh, money of Bitcoin, you know, with absolute uh, finite scarcity um, uh, in a deflationary world, uh, you know, with deflationary economics, like how would okay. the world would look like in financial lending, borrowing, entrepreneurship, investment, technological amazing innovation? Question. Yeah, amazing question. Uh, okay, so first of all, let's, uh, let's, uh, the way I understood his book. Um, so the price of tomorrow, why deflation, if I remember correctly, I have the book, it's not handy, I could remember why deflation is anyway, the focus on deflation. Well, first of all, he, his basic uh, prince or uh, uh, thesis is that uh, technology will cause deflation, uh, and then he proves it in in so many different uh, in so many different ways. But what what he does beautifully is is lay out his experience, uh, you know, sort of like I try and do. But he he lived it. He started uh, uh, what was the name of the company? BuildDirect.com, I think it was called. Or uh, uh, anyway, talks about the technology of. Uh, of being able to uh, efficiency, efficiency, efficiently supply uh, building uh, contractors uh, because of the internet. Um, you know, you take you, you, you go through his uh, his logic on so many fronts. He talks about uh, history um, again, a, a fantastic book. So, so, but it, he says, look, deflation is a reality. Um, I'm not going to argue with him. I, I I will tell you that there's the markets are telling you right now that there are inflationary concerns, but I just put all that aside. I say, ladies and gentlemen, it's no longer about that interest rate that's set as an expectation as to what future inflationary pressures are going to be. I say it doesn't matter. It's about credit risk now. Okay. It's about the fact that there are credit concerns in global economy because credit is way too large relative to our tax base and therefore don't worry about inflation whether there is inflation and and you could argue that you know Mike, michael saylor says the true rate of inflation is the growth of the money supply and and then we have cpi and it, it you know let's be honest the cpi which could be construed as a uh, somewhat of a manipulated basket of uh uh, products to to measure. Yeah, totally deceptive, in my opinion. It's okay, but look, you know, again, it is what it is. Um, uh, the that inflationary uh, metric is uh, it has been muted for for all the time, and and you argue, well, is it because of technology? And you know, a large screen TV uh, has shown that technology, uh, you know, continually improves. Uh, so the price of a large screen TV always. Uh, uh, deflates, but uh, then you say, okay, well, what about the price of a college education or uh, other things? Let's not go there. Let's. What I want to focus on is it doesn't matter whether there is inflation or deflation. The bigger picture, in my opinion, as a credit trader, is rates are going to be set as a function of credit concern, not just inflation expectations. Gotcha. Well, um, 
<clears throat> you mentioned uh, or tweeted out somewhere, you know, uh, you quoted again, you know, Institute for International Finance. And I didn't even know that, that the global, uh, total global financial assets, I thought they were li around like 400, 500 trillion, but it seems to be like including real estate, $900 trillion. So that's, then that's you made what some I kind believe. of calculation yeah. with, uh, you know, Bitcoin would like take sure. 5%. Can you go into that maybe? Yeah, yeah. Great question. You've done well. I, I, I think you've, uh, I, I like the way you've prepared for this interview. So thank you for these questions. These are lob balls for me because I, you know, I know the answers. Um, but uh, uh, so, yeah, no, look, I'm a, and I've had this conversation with Robert Breedlove and it's, it's an interesting conversation because Breedlove believes you can net out the debt and therefore total global financial assets, including real estate, he thinks is closer to maybe five or 600 trillion. And I think it's closer to, it's larger than 900 trillion because you, you, you keep, keep the debt. You don't net the debt out. And I joke with Breedlove, I go, well, that's because I'm a debt guy. I'm an enterprise value guy and you're an accountant. You're a book value guy, okay? So, or a market cap guy. And, and uh, we joke and we say, but it doesn't matter. It, my number's 900 trillion, okay? Because that's the total, and, and it, it's low. That number was measured in 2019 or 18 maybe, um, or 2017. 17, I, I think, yeah. 2017. So, so look, let's just use 900 trillion to make the math easy. Um, yes, uh, these numbers are so mind boggling that if, uh, you know, one of my, my principles of uh, the conservation of energy theme um, is that I believe that oil and natural gas uh, eventually will become priced in, uh, in Bitcoin. It's a natural evolution for that market. You think about the providers of uh, the countries that sell their valuable natural resources, should they be paid in, or would they rather be paid in Bitcoin, which is conservation of energy, so energy for energy, or do they want to get paid in U.S. dollar uh, uh, fiat. And, uh, well, the answer to me should be quite simple. Uh, so I think more and more that that'll come, it's not going to happen tomorrow and it may not even happen within the next five or 10 years. It doesn't matter. These are very small periods in the financial markets. So let's assume though, that if Bitcoin does become the base currency for energy, uh, the base unit value for energy transactions, I believe it could become the de facto reserve asset of the world. Okay. And if it does, then how much of that $900 trillion could Bitcoin command? It's going to be uh, more than zero. We know that if it's the reserve asset and could it be up to, and I'll throw out a number. Well, why don't you guys throw in a number? Let's throw 20%. I mean, that would be a huge number, but 20% of 900 trillion is what? It's 180 trillion, 180 trillion. And I'm running with this math in my head here, 180 trillion uh, divided by 21 million Bitcoin. Uh, what is that? That's, is that nine? That is about $9 million a Bitcoin. I mean, that number is- I think people can't even fathom- uh, Look, it doesn't matter. It's not our, a zero probability though, right? Yeah. You can't say with, you can't be Peter Schiff and say, I'm 100% certain it'll never get there because no one can be 100% certain. Now, I'm not saying with 100% certainty, it will get there, but you need to do some probability analysis, right? And that's why you can, uh, you, you come up with what's called expected values. And uh, uh, there's- lots of different ways of coming up with a valuation uh, of Bitcoin in the present. And, uh, you know, that's one of them. Uh, that number is monumental. It's, it's, is it possible? Yes. Is it likely? It depends on who you're talking to, but it's not impossible. That's the key. It's not impossible. So, you know, uh, yeah, that's a big number, isn't it? So then you say, okay, what about if it gets 5%? Well, it's one quarter of that. So one quarter of 9 trillion is just under 2 million a coin. Uh, that in itself, that number is just dang big compared to where it's currently trading. And I, on those bit, on that basis, I often say, hey guys, don't overthink this. It's a rounding error. I don't care if it's trading for 55 or 45 or 35 or 75,000 a coin. In the big picture, it could really be a rounding error. Don't overthink it. Yeah. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether it's a rumor or it was an interview with Raul Paul recently. Somebody, I think from NIDIC, said that governments have already started 
Uh, oh, I saw that yesterday. Uh, you know, yeah. Where do you see that. that going? I mean, do you see that that you know Parker Lewis to 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 use Parker Lewis term gradual and suddenly it could all become like so suddenly, like so unexpectedly? Well, it's, not, it's not silly, right? Uh, uh, the central banking system was based off of gold for a while, uh, and you need to hold reserve assets, uh, except for the government of Canada. We sold all our gold. Uh, so, uh, dang, but, uh, you know, the government of Canada can't be, uh, or the central bank of Canada can't be, uh, uh, accused of being the most intelligent person in the room. Is that um, really true, Greg? I mean, what the bank of Canada, the central bank doesn't have any, uh, they have so zero. little. Zero. What? How yes. can that be? I mean, uh, the, you're, you're allowed to do whatever you want. If you think that gold was overpriced or you needed to raise, uh, a okay. uh, different form of uh, of uh, reserve assets, uh, you know. Uh, but yes, we own zero, and uh, that's not good for my kids. And I thought that wow, it would be wonderful if I could actually convince some major economists in Canada to start pitching Bitcoin as a mm -hmm. an alternative. Uh, and you know, if I'm doing it in Canada, and I did not have much success because uh, I can't even convince. Uh, you know, I I, I know of one uh, economist that I've uh, befriended. Well, in fact, I used to work with him for an awful long time who owns Bitcoin, but there really aren't anybody uh, on the bandwagon at the economic think tank level uh, in Canada that's embracing Bitcoin. Um, so it's hard for the institution called the Central Bank, Bank of Canada, uh, to, 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 to make that leap of faith. But yeah, no, it makes sense, right? Reserve assets are reserve assets. And if you want to own the, in my opinion, the reserve asset with the greatest asymmetric return potential that I've ever seen in my 32 years of trading credit. As a risk manager, I'd be like, I better own some of it. If you own zero- That's irresponsible. <laughs> so not I would, <laughs> that's a great word. It is actually, and for my kids, look, it's irresponsible. You are not managing risk according to the potential outcomes. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, quite sometimes, a uh, few times you talk about the G20s. Um, okay. And if we just make, I don't know, can I ask you something about like the European Union, Central sure. Bank and what's going yeah. on with the, with mm -hmm. their fiscal monitor parliament? It's actually just a copying of the copy of the, <laughs> of the US Federal Reserve. So what's going, what's going on in the European Union? Do you think the EU could crash or any other of these states could, could collapse? Oh, so anything could always, uh, you know, I never say never. Okay. Well, I grew up thinking, uh, first of all, my first job, uh, really opened my eyes that, uh, yeah, the risk in the banking system is, uh, is way misunderstood. It certainly was misunderstood by me, but I was a young little, uh, you know, fresh out of school. And, um, the, the, the truth is though, that and anything can happen, especially in the financial market. So basically what happened in 2007, 2008, 2009, which was the scariest moments in my trading career, was that the financial, the, the leverage on the financial institutions balance sheets was basically tra uh, transferred to governments. Okay. So um, we didn't really solve anything in 2008. We uh, did transfer that risk to the balance sheets of the governments. Now, those governments now are over-levered themselves. We've seen that in the numbers that we've calculated. The, does it mean that a country can fail? And the answer is absolutely. We've seen countries fail regularly. They don't happen to generally be the G20, but Argentina has failed on a regular basis and Argentina is part of the G20. So you just start doing some, you know, sensitivity analysis, probability analysis, and you start, you, you say, hey, I better, I better pay attention because it not only has happened historically, you don't think about it potentially happening to a G7 country like Canada, but I'll tell you, Canada's at, uh, in, a, in a pickle right now. So what is the European Central Bank? What is that? Well, as a Canadian, I'm, I'm actually... Uh, uh, somewhat jealous of a country like Portugal uh, or Italy that has worse finances than Canada, uh, but is in better shape on a uh, on a risk adjusted basis because it has a huge institution like the European Central Bank 
uh, behind it. Canada's Bank of Canada, let, let's uh, call a spade a spade. Uh, Canada's economy is only about the size of California. Really? California is a huge economy, but you know, Canada as a country is only the size of California. We do not have the Federal Reserve behind us on a relative basis. We, yeah, we can continue to print money, but Venezuela could continue to print money as well, except eventually that money was worthless. It was shoveled to the side of the street. It's amazing. Um, let me ask you, 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 you said something about the Fulcrum, or I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Fulcrum or Fulcrum Index. So it can be That's right, of. Fulcrum. Yeah, yeah, Fulcrum, yeah. What is that? <laughs> That that so that calculation. So I'll I'll define uh, how I came to the uh, I'll say realization myself or how I uh, became comfortable with uh, with Bitcoin and defining what Bitcoin is to me. So engineers define Bitcoin as digital energy. I, with my twenty odd years at the time of uh, trading credit, I had always been looking for a solution to fiat. Uh, I saw the weaknesses. I just never found the solution. I didn't become a gold bug. Uh, I understood the value of gold, but I didn't jump down that, uh, you know, as this, the, as gold being the savior for everything. But in 2016, when I found uh, Bitcoin, I did believe it was the, the solution uh, because it's built on the blockchain. If, you've, if you have not seen the blockchain in action, please get your listeners to go to tradeblock.com and watch the blockchain working and see the beauty and the technological functionality and the beauty of a true decentralized platform where you're watching transactions somewhere in the world. You don't know where it is. Excuse me, flashing across your screen uh, and then being put into blocks, the mempool. It, it's just a thing of beauty for an engineer. So, hey, Greg, isn't that the beauty, I mean, of Bitcoin? It's the, the full transparency and auditability. I mean, you know, I mean, we can talk about, we could probably talk for hours about the Federal U.S. Federal Reserve Central Bank, the Bank yes. for International Settlement. Yes. That's of high yes. interest to me. Like, how how can it be so opaque, so secretly, and, yeah, and you know, know, with all the criminal well, immunity going on? It's, it's, it's mind-boggling. So, okay, so we're talking the same language. Uh, so, but I found Fiat, uh, I, 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 I knew the shortcomings of Fiat. I had never found the solution. And then I defined, I found Bitcoin. I knew what it offered. I didn't believe that it was as technologically beautiful as it was when it was introduced, uh, when it was shown to me. And then I said, and there's only 21 million and uh, this is the solution. So I think Bitcoin's the anti-Fiat. And if Bitcoin's the anti-fiat, what is a fiat then? Well, fiat has credit risk. And therefore, you can measure, because every single country has a credit default swap spread. And if that CDS is a real number set by the market, open markets, I'm an open market guy, you take that number and you go and you... Uh, multiply that by its the the relative countries uh, or the respective countries uh, unfunded and funded obligations. You come up with a number, and then you cumulate you you add all those numbers together, and you come up with a metric that you can compare to what the intrinsic value of Bitcoin is. In my opinion, it is default protection on a basket of sovereign credits or fiat currencies. So um, the, the key thing to, to think about is it's only one model. This is my model. It doesn't mean it's right, but it's the way that, it, that I'm comfortable with describing what Bitcoin is. And that number today values Bitcoin at between 110,000 US and 160,000 US dollars per Bitcoin based off of these rates that are set in the open market. And as these rates change, the value, the intrinsic value of Bitcoin will change. It's my opinion, though, as the world becomes more aware of the true credit risk, excuse me, the true, the true credit risk of Bitcoin, that, uh, excuse me, the true credit risk of fiats and sovereigns, that the value, those spreads will widen. Again, you need to be compensated for the risk. And as the risk increases, the spreads widen. And as those spreads widen, the intrinsic value of Bitcoin increases. But 
It's one valuation metric, and it shows that Bitcoin is cheap on that valuation metric today. And I'll stand by that because I've traded credit for 30 years, and uh, it's a market that is asymmetric to the downside. And Bitcoin is asymmetric to the upside. It's a beautiful thing for a credit guy to find something that actually goes in the opposite direction. Because credit guys, it, when you lend money to somebody at $100, uh, you make a loan for $100. If that person's credit quality goes higher, meaning they become less risky, they're not going to give you more than $100 back or the coupon on the $100. You'll just get your money back and the coupon. It's not like they say, hey, I'm doing so well, I'm going to pay you more. No, no, no. That goes to the equity holder, the subordinate uh, claim. Uh, but what happens if they start doing really poorly? Well, you're still, you didn't lend to them at the right rate. And that rate is not compensating you for the true risk. So that's why credit is asymmetric to the downside. Whereas Bitcoin, the beauty of Bitcoin, in my opinion, is it's asymmetric to the upside. So for a credit guy, boy, th th this is fun. When you find something like that, it's really fun. And the exponential function, I think, is is hardly understood. It's it's I think uh, for a lot most people, it's uh, or for you know for the human brain, it's it's probably not really imaginable. Like the the, the by order of magnitude functions. Yeah. No. No. Look, it's uh, it is. It's uh, you know the the order of magnitude. You 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 nailed it. And and uh, everyone says, oh, you were lucky. Uh, if you got into Bitcoin, uh, I don't know, in my case, under a thousand bucks, and now it's 50 times higher. And I will tell you, I believe that it's actually less risky and more certain. It's not a hundred percent certain, but the likelihood of it achieving where I think it could go is now higher four years later. Why? Well, network effect, adoption, uh, durability, right? I mean, there's been, there's been a fork. There's been, a t uh, it's, it's under attack every single day. It hasn't failed. Uh, it's therefore stronger. The uh, hash power is, is higher, the uh, strength of the network, and it's got a trillion dollar market cap. This is key, okay? Once you get to a trillion dollars, it opens eyes for institutions. Because why? If you, if you um, assume that Bitcoin was a company, Bitcoin would be probably within the top, well, I'm not probably, I'm certain it's within the top 10 largest companies in the world. Well, what, what investment investor does not have exposure to the top 10 country, uh, companies in the world? There's not none. Okay. Uh, so Apple being the largest or actually Saudi Aramco, uh, the largest non uh, uh, global company, uh, Apple, etc. Microsoft, all of these are multiple trillion dollar uh, uh, companies. Well, Bitcoin's already uh, is now bat in that uh, in that community. And as I said, when I first started, uh, it was a couple hundred billion. And uh, that's too small for a lot of uh, big pension funds and institutional investors to take seriously. Wow, amazing. I want to uh, take a different tangent here and maybe talk, also talk about, you know, maybe countries like Iran, you know, start like, you know, in order to circumvent the sanctions and embargoes, whatever, to yeah. go into mining. And you're part of the, maybe you talk a little bit about, you're part of the Validus Power Corporation, you know, it provides, it says, oh, provides business and communities the ability to generate reliable and efficient power at scale on demand anywhere, whether on or off the grid. So yes, that's Validus Power. Um, the exciting thing for me is that Validus can actually, it has a mobile fleet of, uh, and I'll bring my engineering in here. It has a mobile fleet of trailer trucks that can actually, that, you know, one trailer truck will carry a 35 megawatt, which is a generator, which a 35 megawatt generator is essentially a jet engine. Okay. So if you look out your window when you're on a jet, and you see one of these beautiful turbofan uh, uh, engines that run on jet fuel. Uh, well, our, our generator runs on natural gas. So we, can, we have a, uh, a fleet that can uh, be used to go into a field that is burning flare gas and venting this pollution into the atmosphere, and we can tap that energy source within six and a half hours, 
clean the natural gas if it needs to be cleaned, which generally it does when it's flare gas. So it's conditioned, it's run through the generator, and then you uh, you you attach Bitcoin miners to the um, uh, to the energy output, and uh, within six and a half hours, you're mining Bitcoin using a wasted energy product. And it's scalable because one jet engine can become three jet engines. And all of a sudden, three jet engines, you're doing 100 megawatts. This is a massive, massive opportunity because 100 megawatts for people that don't understand is like the same amount of power that it takes or more power than it takes to run a, a factory that produces automobiles. So you're taking this wasted energy source, you are mining Bitcoin. And then I'll take it one step further. Imagine if, uh, or not imagine if, if you attach that energy source to the grid uh, and you, the grid needs peaking power, like what happened in Texas uh, a couple of months ago or a month ago, um, that can help stabilize the grid. So you, you stop mining Bitcoin and you turn the power to the grid to provide peaking power to the grid, it stabilizes the grid. I mean, there's just so many cool uh, and beneficial outcomes. And yeah, that's called Validus Power. I'm proud to be part of this. It's uh, run by a guy that I uh, view to be one of the foremost uh, electricity experts in, certainly in Canada, if not North America. This man is, uh, you know, built a business on it has field tested these units for four years. This is not a dream. This is a reality. Okay. And uh, it's here and it's, you know, it, it, it accomplishes a number of things. It takes an, a wasted energy source. Uh, it, it produces a revenue stream out of that. And even better, it helps to clean the environment. I'm not going to say it's green energy, but Hey, it's a lot better than venting methane into the into the air and it destroying the ozone. Or if you light it on fire and it flares, uh, creates acid rain and uh, carbon uh, dioxide. Yeah. Uh, this is a solution. And one would expect, you know, that where are all the environmentalists <laughs> who would, who should be cheerleading this? Okay, so sustainable it's environment. Yeah, look, all the environmentalists are like, oh, a Bitcoin boils the oceans yeah. I, they don't they're they're sort of like well i don't even want to hear this because my status quo bias is that bitcoin is bad for the environment and that's how i'm thinking and it, it's education like everything you and right you know how did you, uh, let me throw this back at you how, how did you get involved in bitcoin and when you said around 2016 like you know well you missed it for i'm gonna say six and a half seven years and so did yeah. i you so, know, there's, you know, it's, yeah, it's, there's, you know, there are people um, who come, uh, I know people who even, you know, actually came from the libertarian, you know, more Austrian right, economics yeah. part mm -hmm. or about freedom. So there's always an angle, but for me, it's always, you know, but for me, it's like, I thought this is the future for humanity that I envision, which, which can facilitate and accelerate the process of, um, evolution on every on every layer and level you can think of not only technologically but like societal because i was just gonna you know you paraphrased or you quoted actually ross stevens in your report yeah. where you know all these like bitcoin mining like uh and, and energy uh, consumption taking place the the civilization will sort of follow i'm not I'm just paraphrasing him but this okay. is what fascinates me like maybe this is how we can create more you know, stateless, uh, without any borders, without any nation states or government or decentralized what, what, communities. Where I was going, where, where I was going is that the, it took you time to get there, right? So it takes, it's education. It's, it's you know, just because somebody like an, a knucklehead like me says, oh, you got to own Bitcoin. Well, most people will actually do their own research and, 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 and try and fall down that rabbit hole themselves. Um, and then you assume that they can, uh, they can understand most of these concepts. Uh, all I will say is it's remarkable what we've accomplished in 12 years. So we have to appreciate that it is still owned by less than 1% of the global population. Okay. Which means of those 1% that actually do own it, do they all understand its power? And I would say no, because Every day, I learn more. Every, I, you know, ask anybody to explain the difficulty adjustment, and of that one percent that own it, they could not describe it. Yet, I think that could be the most beautiful and most important 
component of the entire Bitcoin network. But it's not easy. Like the 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 the, the person or people that designed this were absolutely brilliant. Uh, and to think that this existed 12 years ago and it hasn't changed and it's run flawlessly for these 12 years, despite probably being the network under the most attack, uh, both uh, uh, by hackers as well as by uh, the traditionalists, right? Oh, Bitcoin, it's horrible. It's uh, no, no, guys, you're just intellectually lazy. Okay, do your work and then understand, like you said, this is what our kids need. Our kids are not macroeconomists, econo, econo, macro economic, economic, I'm mispronouncing macro, whatever <laughs> they are. They, they aren't, and yet they will be, but it's up to us to make that choice or direct that choice for them. Why? Well, because, you know, I'm 57 years old. Let's hope I learned something over. Let's be honest. When you graduate from university, you really know very little. You're given a base grounding or a level of knowledge, but you still know very little about how the true world works. And sometimes it's a lot more simple than the textbooks make out. And why is that? Well, because the world doesn't work on theory. It works on actual practice and actual practice is what gets things done. So Bitcoin could have been theoretical for a long time, but no, no, no. Now it's actually working. It's there. It's 12 years old and gets stronger by the day. And that that's exciting for me. And again, if you keep studying it, you'll, you'll pick up different things and you'll say, Oh my God, it works in this and it works like this, and it, it could provide uh, really exciting solutions for all the problems that a fiat economy uh, generates. And, and I, I forgot to mention one thing. A fiat economy is based on collateral values increasing, okay? That's the banking system requires collateral values to increase. Well, in a deflationary environment, like we talked about with uh, Jeff Booth's potential, well, that's even more pressure for the fiat uh, economy because if collateral values are decreasing, well, when you're 25 times levered and your value of collateral decreases over time, it does not work. It barely works now where we have engineered or we have manipulated rates and values, asset values to increase, if they stop, it's really over. The fiat system is really over. And I don't want the fiat system to end. I'm just happy that because there's no choice. If it does, the hardship, the general hardship for the world will be incalculable. Uh, I'm just well, the key happy is transition, a Greg, right? I mean, I think the key is really the transition phase because you know I don't want to you know see people suffering. I think it yeah. could really wreak havoc. Oh, no question. Listen, uh, the, it, it, hopefully there will be a transition. Right now, there's a parallel, uh, a symbiotic relate. Well, call it a parallel uh, system called Bitcoin, which is way better in my opinion. Um, I'd love to, uh, you know, there will always be. Well, in my lifetime, most likely, there will always be a fiat system and a Bitcoin system. Maybe the next generation, there is a 100% transition. I'm even skeptical of that, but it doesn't matter. Uh, this is a solution that allows you to hedge the uh, inefficiencies of the fiat system. Wow, this was a really great conversation. I mean, really enjoyed this. Just to wrap this up, um, sure. because, you know, we've had this discussion and I, after I had this talk with An Anas Anachi, uh, An uh, I think his name's on oil and energy and disruptive technologies, there was, you know, sort of discussion. I thank you for your backup or your comment explanations. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, yeah, be, uh, and I think you know there's still a lot of fun going on, and um, but you know my my purpose for uh, during this conversation was uh, while talking to Anas, you know, like what 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 could like how could the market look like and and technological uh, disruptions look like uh, when when the whole you know structures are rooted in Bitcoin. Uh, and you quoted, you know, uh, which I love, you know, uh, Henry Ford, in, also in your report, an energy currency that, that would stop wars. Do you see, can you envision like a world where finally we have, you know, a more balanced uh, uh, life, or, uh, you know, more peaceful, more prosperity, abundance? I can only hope so. Um, I will tell you this uh, last year has been particularly troubling uh, for me as a open market uh 
free markets here, uh, the amount of regulation that's come down uh, to, you know, to uh, protect, if you will, um, the uh, the world against a pandemic. Uh, you know, I, I, be- I believe, and this is just my opinion, has been uh, done without regard to the costs, okay? I understand the benefits, but you cannot uh, do anything without a proper cost benefit analysis. And I, I don't want to get into the, to the different things. I just will say that, look, uh, the, some of the stuff that you read about, uh, that, or you may have read about in the, in the, uh, epic, uh, book, 1984 by George Orwell, some of this stuff was remarkably prescient in, uh, and I don't want, I, I'm, I'm an open market free, uh, marketeer. I do not believe in socializing losses, and I do believe in uh, I do believe in supporting the less fortunate people in in the world. And less, uh, uh, you know, you need to support your uh, the portions of your population that don't uh, uh, that haven't been as uh, as advantaged as you know as I have. Uh, and I'll be honest about that. But I believe I worked hard to to become advantaged. I I did not grow up as a uh, uh, particularly wealthy. Um, uh, family and uh, trust me that I'm not particularly wealthy now, but I'm better off than I was, uh, when I was growing up. And I did that because I worked pretty darn hard. Okay. Uh, again, the conservation of work, uh, I want my store of value, uh, to that I can pass to my kids in something that will not be debased. Uh, the, again, it's all cost benefit, uh, understanding the necessity the efficient amount of government regulation that's needed rather than an authority, authoritarian uh, uh, type of uh, living. And, and this is, what does Bitcoin do? It, 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 it solves a lot of these, uh, not just uh, monetary concerns, but some of these um, the, uh, theoretical or, or subjective governmental uh, opinions as well, because you can take your freedom and, uh, you can vote with your uh, belief that uh, the purest form of monetary energy, which is Bitcoin, solves a lot of problems. Yeah, thanks for sharing your thoughts, uh, Greg, because, uh, you know, we have an 11-week-old uh, baby girl. And oh, you know, the thoughts that go on to my mind, like, what kind of future is my daughter going to live in? You well, know, what you're oh. doing right now is, 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 you know, I'm not saying we have the ultimate solution, but my belief is that our solution is better than the existing status quo. And uh, there are so many smart people in the Bitcoin communities, and, and I, I take my hat off to you and the, um, the efforts you're doing to educate people. Uh, I, uh, I don't have all the answers, but I have experience. And I'll tell you, it's scary. I'm feeling the same sort of scary, uh, I guess, spider senses, if you will, that I felt in 2006 before the last financial crisis. And once the financial crisis happens, you, 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 it's too late to really hedge. You need to put your uh, insurance, you need to purchase your insurance prior to the event. And, and, and that's what I'm trying to, uh, to pitch. Yeah, this is what actually, you know, self-responsibility and uh, self-sovereignty means uh, for the first steps. So Greg, thank you so much. Where can people follow you? Any other links or anything coming up? Um, you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm excited that uh, Preston Pish now, yeah, this I'm very course, excited to be on yeah. your your podcast. I'm not trying to compare the different no, of course, ones, but 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 listen, I'm excited about that one. It's coming up on April 5th, mm-hmm. uh, and I want to thank you and all the guys that have reached out to me to uh, to actually allow me to promote what I view uh, the way I view Bitcoin, and it's 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 generating some uh, uh, some. So I've I've had so many nice. Um, uh, responses on, you know, direct private, uh, some very public, but uh, most of them on a private basis about, wow, opening my eyes. Thank you for trying, for doing this. Um, this is for my kids. It's for your 11, did you say 11 month old? 11 uh, weeks. Actually. 11 weeks. That's crazy. 11 <laughs> weeks, man. And, and you're doing what you're doing with an 11 week old daughter. Uh, uh, you're, you're the type of guys that give me uh, confidence that the future is bright, okay? The future is bright because we have this uh, community that is optimistic. It's realistic, though. It's, a, it, it's built on realism. It's not built on 
socialized losses. It's built on the fact that you need to develop a better system. So uh, my hat goes off to you. I, I'm really excited. I have three kids. Okay. My youngest, my youngest uh, child is a daughter and she's 20 though. She's 20. Okay. Yours is 11 weeks. We have a lifetime in between our two, but I do really thank you for reaching out. Yeah, we can only do this together. To be honest, I mean, you know, as a lot of Bitcoiners say, if it wasn't for Bitcoin, I think a lot of us would be not maybe depressive, but you know, we would we would be really without hope. It's like the root solution to everything. You know? I will agree with that. Okay, I will agree with it. So, Kivan, so, so so nice to speak with you. Thank you again for having me on. Uh, reach out to me, any of your listeners, if you have private questions you don't feel like asking on the. Uh, uh, on a, on a public platform, I um uh, I enjoy seeing when the light bulb goes on in people and when that moment where there's <laughs> light. Hey. And and here's the thing, okay, guys, ladies and gentlemen, it's you don't have to put a hundred percent of your wealth in yeah. it. I'm not saying that. Just get off zero. Yeah, you're taking immeasurable risks right now if you own zero Bitcoin. It's less risky to own, Jim Cramer says 5%. Okay, let's go with 5%. It's less risky to own 5% of your investment portfolio or your savings in Bitcoin than it is to have zero exposure to Bitcoin. Remember Wonderful. That. Beautifully okay. said. Those words of wisdom. Thank you so much, Thank you. Greg. Okay. It's been a pleasure. Have a great day. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks, buddy. Okay, how was that? That was amazing. I mean, talking to experts and who have like over 30 or 32 years of experience in banking, credit, uh, whatever that is, you know, macro te technically speaking, and then breaking it down a language that maybe even a seven year old child could understand that is just amazing. So make sure you follow Greg Foss and read his report and uh, follow him on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter, subscribe to my YouTube channel, podcast platform. If you have any questions, suggestions, or any wishes for any future discussions, uh, panel discussions, just let me know. I'm the host of the Kevin Navani Connection and see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.